In this video, we're going to look at velocity time graphs. But before we do, let's look at a few things. Now when it comes to velocity time graphs, one of the things that we'll be calculating would be acceleration. Now acceleration is equal to a change in velocity over time. So when it comes to a change in velocity, we'll measure that in meters per second and time will be measured in seconds. So it's going to look like this. Change in velocity would be meters per second over time, which would be in seconds. So M is for meters and S is for seconds, and this will be per. Now this will be meters divided by seconds, divided by seconds again. So let's rewrite this. So the meters per second, we write it as this meters per second. So this is the velocity here. And then this division sign, we'll put it like this, divide. And now the seconds, now let's be S like this, which is S over 1. So we know we're going to change the divide to multiply and invert this S over 1. But, you know, I'll break things down. So I'll just rewrite it like this divided by, and the seconds, I'll write this as seconds over one. So now when I change the divide and multiply, we'll have meters per second, multiply by, and seconds over one will turn to one over seconds. So one over seconds. So you see, you change the divide to multiply and invert our divisor. So now nothing would cancel so we multiply across. So meters by one would just be meters and seconds by seconds, so let's be seconds squared. So we'll have meters, that is meters by one, over and seconds by seconds will be seconds squared. So now my unit for acceleration will be meters and this line will be per second squared. So you write that as meters per second squared. And we know with the law of indices that, you know, we could bring this S squared above the division sign and the power will just change to negative. So from positive 2, it will change to negative 2. So if I bring this S squared above the division sign, what we'll have is meters and you put seconds squared like this. And this will be a unit for acceleration. Now, the thing about a velocity time graph is that the gradient gives acceleration and the area under the graph gives distance. So I'm going to write that the gradient of a velocity time graph gives acceleration. And then I'm going to put the area under a velocity time graph gives distance. Now, one more thing to remember. Velocity is a vector quantity, which means it has both magnitude and direction. Now, if we look back here at this formula for acceleration, we will see that acceleration is a change in velocity over time. So if this velocity is a vector quantity, that would make this acceleration also a vector quantity, meaning acceleration would have both magnitude and direction. So that means you can have acceleration in one direction being positive and the acceleration in the opposite direction being negative. And what we call a negative acceleration would be deceleration. So acceleration is to speed up. So positive acceleration is to speed up and a negative acceleration is to slow down. So I'm just going to put here a note. A negative acceleration is called deceleration. So now let's go and analyze a velocity time graph. So here we have a velocity time graph. We have on the y-axis, we have velocity measured in meters per second. And on the x-axis, we have time measured in seconds. And we have the graph below represents the journey of a car. 
So from A to B, we have a positive gradient and a positive gradient will give us positive acceleration. So between A and B, the car is speeding up, accelerating. And of course, this being a straight line means the acceleration is constant, meaning the acceleration is not varying. Whatever the acceleration is at this point, it will be the same acceleration at this point. Now from B to C, we have a horizontal line and a horizontal line has a gradient of zero, which means the acceleration between B and C would be zero, which also means between B and C, the car is moving at a constant velocity. And we can just look across right here and see that the velocity is seven meters per second. So between B and C, the car is moving at a constant velocity of seven meters per second. And now from C to D, we have a negative gradient, which would mean this portion of the graph the car is decelerating because negative gradient would mean negative acceleration and negative acceleration is deceleration. So A to B, speed up, B to C, constant velocity, and C to D, slow down. And you can see from A, we starting from rest, meaning the velocity is zero at A. So we accelerating from rest from A to B, and from C to D, we are slowing down, but we come into a complete stop because at D, the velocity is zero. So we're slowing down, coming to a stop. So now let's analyze the portion of the graph from A to B. So I'm going to write from A to B. And of course, if we want to get gradient of the line from A to B, we'll have to mark off the change in Y and the change in X. So marking that off here. So here we'll have our change in y. And we can see it's from 7 meters per second to 0 meters per second. So our change in y would be positive 7. And that would be positive 7 meters per second because we have a positive gradient. We'll put our change in y as positive. So change in y is 7. And our change in x, we are going from 0 to 3. So our change in x is simply 3. So now our gradient will be equal to a change in y over a change in x, which is equal to 7 over 3. And if we put 7 divided by 3, we get 2.33 reoccurring. So we'll write this to three significant figures, so 2.33. So I'm going to have, this is equal to 2.33. So I'll put, therefore, my acceleration is equal to 2.33 meters per second squared. So now let's look at the journey from B to C. So I'm going to put from B to C. Of course, our gradient here would be equal to zero. So therefore, my acceleration will be equal to zero meters per second squared. And that's from B to C. So if you are not accelerating, which is you are not speeding up, but also you are not slowing down because negative acceleration will be to slow down. That means you are moving at a constant velocity. And that constant velocity you can just read off from the graph, which would be 7 meters per second. So on the next page, I'll go and write that from B to C, we have a constant velocity of 7 meters per second. So I just want to write here that from B to C, we have a constant velocity of 7 meters per second. So now let's look at the final section of this graph from C to D. So again, here we have a negative gradient, which will give us a negative acceleration. So let's look at the gradient from C to D. So marking off the change in Y and the change in X. So now remember here the gradient is negative, which means our change in Y is going to be negative. So our change in Y is equal to, and we are going from seven meters per second all the way down to zero meters per second. So we're going to put negative seven. 
and our change in x would be from 5 to 10. So we can subtract 10 from 5 and get 5. So a change in x would be 10 take away 5, which is 5. So now from C to D, we're going to have gradient is equal to the change in y over the change in x. We're going to have negative 7 over 5. So we're going to type on the calculator negative 7 divided by 5, which is equal to negative 1.4. So that's equal to negative 1.4, which would mean our acceleration is equal to negative 1.4 meters per second squared. And now we could call this negative acceleration a deceleration. So deceleration is equal to positive 1.4 meters per second squared. So you see with the deceleration, you don't put a negative sign because deceleration means negative acceleration. All right, so this will be my analysis for the acceleration for this velocity time graph. Now let's deal with the distance. Now remember, the area under the velocity time graph would give distance. So we can calculate the distance covered for the entire journey or the distance covered in the various sections. All right, so for distance, let's look at our first section here from A to B. Here we have a right angle triangle. And we know the area of a triangle would be base by height over 2 or a half base by height. So I use the base by height over 2. So this would be the base and this would be height. Because you know the base and height of a triangle must always be at right angles to each other. And here we have our right angle. Now let's put that in. So we have our right angle here. So you can clearly see the base and the height at right angles to each other. So I'm going to put from A to B. We're going to have area is equal to base by height over 2. And of course, the base would be the change in X, which is 3. Multiplied by the height, which is my change in Y, which would be 7 over 2. 3 by 7 is 21, so we have 21 over 2. And 2 into 21 will be 10 and a half or 10.5. So let's put 10.5. And that would mean the distance is equal to 10.5 meters. Now the reason I know the distance is in meters and not kilometers is because my velocity is in meters per second. That tells me the distance is in meters and the time is in seconds. Well, we also have the time here in seconds to know that the time is in seconds. But our unit for distance would be meters. Now from B to C, what we have here is a rectangle. I know the area of a rectangle is length by breadth. So the longer side will be the length and the shorter side will be the breadth or the width. So from 3 to 5, that's 1, 2, so the width is 2, and of course the length would be the change in y on both sides, which is 7. So I'm going to put area is equal to length by breadth, and the length is related to the change in y, which is 7, and the breadth is the width, which is just 2. Okay, count the blocks here from 3, 3 to 4, 1, and then 4 to 5 is 2. So width is 2. 7 twos are 14, so we have 14 as the area, well, we can put units squared, put units squared, same thing here, units squared, which would mean the distance is equal to 14 meters. And now from C to D, Again, here we have a right angle triangle. So I'll just put in the right angle here. And again, the area of a triangle is base by height over 2. So this will be the base here, which is 5. And this will be the height here, which is 7. Now we ignore any negative sign, right? So we're talking about the length of a side. So it will just be 7. And this will be 5. 
So area is equal to base by height over 2. So the base is 5 and the height is 7 over 2. So that's equal to. And seeing that I run out of space here, I'll just work this on the calculator. So we'll have 7 by 5, which is 35. That's equal to the 5 divided by 2, which is 17.5. So we have 17.5 units squared, which would mean the distance from C to D is equal to 17.5 meters. Now, if I wanted the total distance for the entire journey, I could simply add these up, 10.5, 17.5, and 14. Or I could have found the area of the entire shape. And this entire shape is a trapezium. And we know the area of a trapezium is a half, the sum of the two parallel sides, multiplied by the height. Now, before we go and find the area of the entire shape, let's just add up the distances to see what the total distance would be. So I'll add the 10.5 plus the 14 plus the 17.5. And we get 42. So my total distance from A to D is equal to 42 meters. All right, so on this page here, I'm going to look at the area of the trapezium. That's this trapezium here, which will be the distance for the entire journey. Now we have our parallel sides here. BC is parallel to AD. So from A to D, and let's put this here as my parallel side. And we are from B to C. This is my parallel side. Talking about the lengths of the parallel sides. Well, from B to C, we have from three to five. So the difference there between three and five is two. So here we're gonna have two. From A to D, we're going to have from 0 to 10. So that'll just be 10. So 10. And now the height is the perpendicular distance between the two parallel sides. So if I bring a line down like this, it would form a right angle with this parallel side, which would mean it's at a right angle with this parallel side as well. So this will be the height. And this is from 7 to 0. So that will just be 7. So now I have the lengths of my two parallel sides and also the length of the height. So I'm going to put area of the trapezium is equal to a half times the sum of the two parallel sides, which will be 2 plus 10. That's my two parallel sides here, 2 plus 10, multiplied by the height. And the height would be 7. So 2 plus 10 is 12, so a half of 12 multiplied by 7. And of course, a half multiplied by 12 is 6, multiplied by 7, and 6 sevens are 42. So units square. So that's the area of the trapezium, 42 units squared, which will be the total distance for the entire journey. So therefore, my total distance is equal to 42 meters. And as you can see, we got the same answer when we add up the 10.5, that's from A to B, the 14 from B to C, and the 17.5 from C to D. We add all those up and we got 42 meters. So for a trapezium like this, you can find the area of the individual sections and add them up. Or you can find the area of the entire trapezium and get the total distance. And that will bring us to the end of this video.